Good morning and welcome. This is 10 Years Hence. Our speaker this morning is Dr. Hendrik Hamann. Dr. Hamann is currently a senior manager and distinguished research staff member at the IBM TJ Watson Research Center in New York. He received his PhD from the University of Göttingen in Germany. In 1999, he joined the IBM TJ Watson Research Center, where he is leading the Physical Analytics and Cognitive Internet of Things program. Hammond's current research interests include sensor networks, sensor-based physical modeling, machine learning, artificial intelligence, as well as big data technologies. Hammond has authored and co-authored more than 100 peer-reviewed scientific papers and holds over 110 patents and has over 100 pending patent applications. Dr. Hammond is an IBM master inventor, a member to the IBM Academy of Technology, and has served on governmental committees such as the National Academy of Sciences, the National Science Foundation, and as an industrial advisor to the universities. He won several awards, including the 2016 AIP Prize for Industrial Applications of Physics. He is a member of the American Physical Society, Optical Society of America, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and the New York Academy of Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hendrik Hamann. Yeah, good morning, um, and thanks so much for the kind introduction. I'm excited to be here, and uh, I hope you have a lot of questions. Um, and um, I, I understand there's a question and answer se section at the end, but if there's something super urgent, I wouldn't mind even getting questions in between from time to time. All right, today's presentation uh, has a strange title, uh, Big Data Gets Physical. I have to admit, um, the title, I actually stole that from a book chapter. We'll get to that a little bit later. Um, here's the outline of the presentation. I will talk to you a little bit about IBM Research, which helps you, you know, I'm from IBM Research, helps you to understand a little bit what we do, our perspective. Uh, then, uh, I think that's probably most important for this audience, we talk about technologies, trends in technology, what's happening in technology. Right, so uh, talk a little bit about scalability. That may not mean a lot to a lot of you folks, but of course, Internet of Things, AI, right, artificial intelligence, big data. And then I will end with some concrete examples. And I apologize for the examples. It will be fairly uh, concrete. And um, you saw that from my resume, I'm a fairly technical person. There will be also some technical content, but I hope you will find that interesting as well. Okay, let's start with IBM Research. Um, so, uh, for people who don't really know IBM, right, if we are not as, as known, we're an old company, and probably not as much um, being talked than, uh, about than Google and others. But we have, what you see here, we have roughly 400,000 employees, so we're not a small company. So I always keep on saying I have 400,000 brothers and sisters. Out of that, we have 250,000 technical people. Out of that 400,000, we have roughly less than 1% of people working in the research division. Now, the research division is um, not what you typically have in a corporation. It's really an independent division. Uh, we are not reporting to any of the business units. We report directly to the CEO, which is Gini Ometti. Um, we don't, we, our only task is to really um, look out for new technologies, invent new technologies, which will have an impact uh, to the corporation and uh, to, the, uh, to the public good at large. Uh, we have uh, quite a lot of accomplishments. We are the patent leaders. Uh, we have actually won even Nobel Prizes uh, for uh, different microscopes over the years, so um, we're quite happy about all these accomplishments. Here are some examples of the innovations. Um, some are kind of old, but maybe a lot of people don't realize um, IBM invented a lot of the technologies which you use today 
um, in, your, in your phones, uh, in your computers, in your laptops, or even if you use cloud services, right? So for example, we invented the, uh, the first really large-scale storage technology, right? Which is a hard disk, right? Which most of you people still have in their laptops. We uh, invented um, the DRAM memory, which is a memory chip which actually supports all the transactions of the microprocessor, right? We played for years a key role in building a microprocessor similar to what Intel does. And then if you look into more recent advances, of course, uh, some people may have seen the Jeopardy demonstration, which is uh, a demonstration of artificial intelligence. And then, right, um, this, um, this, this game which um, we won against the um, against the all-time champion in the game of Jeopardy, and then maybe even more recently uh, advances in quantum computing. Now what is important also, we are a worldwide organization, so these 3,000 people are distributed across the world, right? We're a global corporation. Uh, the headquarter is in New York, and that's where I'm from, uh, the TJ Watson Research Center, but we have um, labs all around the globe. And of course, all our clients are all around the globe, and that's why we have labs. Each of those labs, they have certain aspects of what they're working on, what they have specialized in. Um, but by far, the biggest lab is the one in, in New York. OK, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in, in technology. Um, if someone wonders, really, what is the success and I mean, for the, especially for people who are a little bit older, right? Um, you probably have an appreciation a little more than younger people how much technology has advanced, right? Uh, it has tremendously advanced. And why is that? And there is really a single reason for all these advances which we have, right? I mean, you must have seen some old computers, right, which were gigantic. Now today, everything fits on a cell phone. So how was that possible? And it is possible because physics was very kind to us. Because the physics, when we built these transistors, we were able to make them smaller. And there was no cost to it. It was even better. We could make these transistors smaller. And by that, we would make a better and faster transistor. That's why we have faster and faster microprocessors. And because they were smaller, we could produce more. And because we could produce more, we could make more money. And that is really what people refer to when they talk about a scalable technology. Uh, some people refer to that as Moore's law. Uh, but what you see on the chart is this is a transistor counts, right, from 1970s to 2016. I mean, you, you, you have to appreciate, today, we have 20 billion transistors on a square centimeter ship. 20 billion transistors. Each transistor is composed out of just a few hundreds of atoms. So that's the ultimate engineering, right? You engineer something down to the atomic scale, right? You build 20,000 of them, and you do this for $1 or $2, right, per chip. That's pretty, pretty amazing. That is one big secret. And you can see from the 70s, all the way till today, we're able to increase the, uh, the, the numbers of transistors on the chip, which means faster transistors, which meant more capabilities, which meant more money uh, for, for making this. Uh, and that trend has been going on for a very, very long time. It will not be infinite, but that is really one of the key drivers um, of all these changes we saw in technology. Now, this is for a microprocessor. What is interesting, we have the same scalability. That's why scalability is so important if it comes down to storing information. Right? So when I talked on the previous chart, that was for the microprocessor. That's for processing information. Right? Boom. We have uh, increases by, um, by 20 million in the last 30 years. Now We have the same thing uh, if you think about how much information we can store. Uh, per unit area. And you can see that here, right? So uh, in the chart, um, this actually plots from uh, 
the 19, 1955, this is actually where IBM invented the first storage device, scalable magnetic storage device, all the way up to 2010. You can see we have a 20 million enhancement in the numbers of bits we can store per unit area. Right? That is, again, the physics is the same. Physics was very kind to us. We were able to make the smaller and smaller at no cost. In fact, it was even better. We were able to make more money, and we were able to deliver a better product. So everyone was really winning. And we were able to do this every 18 months, 15 to 18 months. Every 15 to 18 months, twice as many transistors, double the storage density, uh, and then provided much better, much better products and much better uh, services to, to, to end, end users and end clients. Now, this is just what happened, right? Again, why was this all possible? And uh, what I'm showing here is this is a wafer. So for people who have never seen that, how all these uh, technologies are being made, they're actually being made on wafers. And on these wafers, you see these little squares. Um, that's a chip. On each chip, I told you, 20 billion transistors. And everything is being printed. It's basically a printing press. It's a, it's a modern version of a money printing press because each time you were printing this and each time you were improving the technology, you could print more money, right? But it is um, the, the really what, what everything... Uh, has uh, what the key what the what the, what the key driver was for everything we see today in in technology. Okay, so I told you right, uh, computation storage networks. Um, every year we had roughly two x better performance if you project this out for the last thirty years, and we had half of the cost uh, per year. So that is what happened on the computation side. What has that, you know, what has that led to? Okay, now we're using, right, all that computation, all that storage, all that network for generating information, right? So now we have massive data, right? Um, you know, some, some people pay, say, 163 zettabytes. So later in the question and answer section, we can figure out how many zeros are 10 to the um, zeta, zeta is, right? Um, Anyway, it's a lot. It's a lot of information. It is by far, um, today, within two years, we generate as much information as we have been generating, right, all the way from, um, all the, way from um, the Stone Ages till today. So the growth of information is tremendous. And now, what do we do with all that data? Well, that data is being, of course, processed by the same by the same technologies we were just talked about, right, by all the, all the transistors, the 20 billion transistors per chip, to create machine learning and AI to create information. That's where we are basically at. Okay. Now, if you think about that process, right, so you're going from computation to data and then to AI, really people talk a lot about um, what uh, digitization and that digitization is uh, progressing. And I think it's important to realize, uh, especially for the context of this presentation, because I want to tell you also something you, which you probably don't know yet, is, uh, of course, it is coming at different rates depending on uh, what is being digitized, right? Um, so, for example, um, the world of business is actually fairly well digitized. Social networks, right, or social interactions, right? That's either Facebooks or LinkedIn's, whatnot, right? We are in the process of digitizing that, right, with the same technologies. But what is really somewhat new, um, you will see why that is a frontier, is um, we are now through what I call the Internet of Things, or what we call the Internet of Things, we are also digitizing the physical world. All right, so what is actually the Internet of Things? Um, so the Internet of Things is really something quite simple, right? We, we networked uh, computers, and now we are networking and connecting 
things, devices in the real physical world, right? Every light bulb has an IP address, refrigerators, um, etc. So uh, that is really what the Internet of Things stands for. For me, the Internet of Things means really uh, the digitization of the physical world, because that's what it, ex what, what it does. But that's really where we are, and that's really what sort of uh, one of the key uh, topics of this presentation is. And now you may also realize why I called this presentation Big data gets physical. All right. Now, what is interesting if you look into the Internet of Things is that um, the data being generated from that technology is growing by more than 44 exabytes. So exabytes, so we had already zettabytes. Zettabytes is more than exabytes, right? But um, uh, exa is 10 to the 18, so 18 zeros, right? quite a lot of data every month. And that comes from devices, right, placed in the physical world, from your cell phones, that comes from drones, that comes from uh, satellites. Um, you may be aware, you may not be aware, right, there are startups in Silicon Valley who are now building these shoebox uh, satellites, shoebox-sized satellites. They're sending them up to space, taking enormous amount of data. All right, so um, there's another way to look at this is, um, and that is already a long time ago, 2017, where we had more connected devices than people. And of course, we know also the connection between people. Uh, they're not all, um, all people are not uh, connected with each other. So a tremendous, a tremendous connection, a tremendous growth, growth in all that information. So the bottom line here is, um, right, this is a beautiful satellite shot uh, from some place close by here. Um, the physical world is being digitized, and that will have profound implement, um, uh, implications um, to, to, to many things we do, and we'll touch on that in, in a few minutes. So if you think about what does all this data do, and um, I understand a lot of you are business majors, so um, that might be quite relevant, sorry, that might be quite relevant to you, is it does transform these industries quite dramatically. And I believe, and I think you see already a lot of evidence, that um, a lot of these f old physical industries um, for example, agriculture is a great example, are being transformed. And they're being transformed using data. And they're being transformed in a way where, uh, for example, a company in agriculture, um, let's say, um, right, uh, which would be selling seeds to farmers, are now using data to selling um, outcomes, um, uh, yields, Right? They're selling services. They're not selling anymore the seeds. If they used to be selling a fertilizer, they're now se uh, selling, uh, they will be selling fertigation services. You take automotive, and we're already seeing the, these things, right, already. Companies will be using, right in the old days, we're using um, the car, car manufacturers, right? They were called car manufacturers. They were selling cars, right? Now you think about it, cars are, not being used 90, 95% of the time, they're actually parked, right? So um, you guys are business majors, so you must know this much better, but who on earth would invest so much money into an asset which is only being used 5% uh, of the time? That's nuts, right? So clearly, where things are gonna be going to is that with all that data, with all that information from the physical world, it's now possible to sell transportation services. Um, and the best example I have for that transformation is actually my own industry. So IBM is actually a very good example for that, right? We used, IBM used to actually sell computers. So for the people who are really, really old, they may remember that. Um, but we were actually selling, and we are still selling, physical computers, right? In the beginning, we were selling it actually to the, to the, um, to, to the consumers, then we were only selling it to the enterprises, etc. But today, the, the market for selling actual computer hardware is very, very small. 
Now, today, through data, through the digitization of this, you're selling computation services, right? You're selling the cloud. <coughs> On the cloud, you have no idea what computer is being used. You don't have to own a computer. You don't care. It's the same thing with transportation services. You don't have to own a car. So that, that's, I think, what, what we will be seeing. And why is this all happening? And you can believe it or not, but uh, there are all these studies, right, including studies IBM did, uh, but McKinsey, Kisco, whatever. They think through that transformation, through that digital transformation of these physical industries, which are now right where we are now in the process of digitizing them, uh, there will be billions, billions, or trillions even saved whatever number you believe. But I think it's pretty obvious that there are enormous savings and efficiency improvements you can get. Okay. Um, I told you in the beginning that the title of this presentation I stole somewhere. There's an interesting book which talks about some of these trends, which is called, it used to, um, which is called dataism. Uh, it was written by a New York Times reporter, Steve Lohr. And he has a chapter there which says data gets physical. And um, basically one, of, one chapter really t tells you a little bit what all this data does in, 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 uh, in agriculture, actually. OK. Now, I said in the beginning, right, so for, if, if you followed my presentation so far, you would think, well, um, so what is, what is really new or, or, or what, what's happening, right? It seems like everything is done, right? We're digitizing everything. Industries will be transformed. And uh, that is true, and that will happen. But we're talking about something which will happen probably in the next 10, 15 years. Now, why is IoT interesting? And it is interesting because it is the last frontier or it is one of the last frontiers of digitization. And I have this, this plot here. Unfortunately, it doesn't come qu quite through. But if you think about um, how you retrieve information, right? If you want to retrieve information from the World Wide Web, right, you go to Google. I don't know whether you've ever wondered yourself, right? But uh, Google can search the World Wide Web. In fact, not only Google, others can do this too. That is 45 billion web pages in 0.5 seconds. That's quite a big number, right? So how, can, how on earth can they do this so fast? Well, the reason is um, they thought quite hard about it. And they started indexing all these web pages. And they update this permanently. And they parallelize everything. And they can search these 45 billion web pages all in parallel. So when you come in with your request and say, oh, I want to search for um, furniture or whatever, then all that happens in parallel, and everything is, 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 it can be returned within 0.5 seconds. So that's how they do it, right? Great, and, and it's a great technology. So you can search. If you think about um, other, other, other things you can search and you can discover, where you can actually use, um, take better, take advantage of all that data. Um, in the business world, yeah, you can search a lot of data for, okay, previous transactions. A lot of that data might be siloed or might be private, but it is fairly well indexed. It's all about how I'm indexing the data so I can search it, retrieve it. The interesting part is, if you think about IoT data, data from physical <coughs> systems, can I search that? Is there, is, there something in, is there something which is an analogy to right, what Google does for the World Wide Web? And there isn't. So it is not there yet. And there are various reasons for that, because it's damned hard to do it. And there are many, many other reasons. And I, I, I tell you a little bit about that. But that's really why um, technology is still focusing very much on that area, what you can do there. So um, one reason, and I already touched on that, is why this is so hard is, well, the first thing is the data, and I already told you, coming from physical systems is actually bigger than any of the other data sources which we have, right? I told you earlier that we have uh, 44 exabytes per month, which is being generated from the Internet of Things. So if I would have uh, 44 exabytes per month, 
that would correspond to 100 million hard disk drives, right? Uh, so for, I don't know, um, but hard disk drives are sort of, uh, they're like cigar box size uh, devices, which is spinning disks, right? So I would need 100 million of those. But then remember, right, they're physically um, still large, despite all the progress which we've made on, on shrinking things, right? So they're uh, a, a terabyte hard disk drive is, is on the order of a right, cigar box, something like this. Anyway, I would need 100 million hard disk drives. And if I wanted to process that information, I would need 100 million servers in a data center. So 100 million servers. And I, remember, I add 44 exabytes every month. So that's quite a lot of data. Because that data is so big, it cannot be moved. It's, it's, it, is, it has very different properties. In addition, data from the Internet of Things is, um, is, very, um, is very different than, than other data. For example, it, um, it has noise. Um, it is often expensive. Um, Internet of Things is obviously also um, happening in the, real, in the real world, which means when you use that data, you want to make decisions which matter. And the decisions which matter are typically high-stake applications, right? That's when it matters. Otherwise, right, um, no one would pay for it. There would be no value in the data. Meaning you have noise in the data, you have very large data, you have a lot of these challenges which uh, prevents us from, from really doing something similar where I can just search and get information and value from all that data. So that's where we are today. Here is an example when uh, I want to um, sort of highlight why this data is so big. And uh, I tell you also why this has some implication. So if I, I, every one of you guys, of course, uh, use, use weather, right? Weather information, maybe on your iPhone, you want to look up what the weather is on the weekend. I hear there's going to be another snowstorm actually here. <laughs> anyway, uh, there is, there, by the way, there are all kinds of weather models. We, we get to that topic a little bit later. Uh, but if you, um, if, yeah, a global weather model today, um, this is just an example here, um, generates, um, never mind the chart, just focus on this, generates around eight terabytes a day. So eight terabytes, a single weather model, for, which, which gives you the information about the weather around the globe, right? Eight terabytes. So eight terabytes, so you are fully understand this, how long would it take so let's say I already have my eight terabytes downloaded, right? Here, the, the gentleman who's working on his uh, laptop over there. So he has already that, that data on it. If you wanted to use that data and move it from the disk to the memory, right, where the microprocessor can do something, that alone would take you 22 hours. That's big data, right? That's huge. And that means it's very difficult to move it even if I have it in the same physical location, right? Uh, I'm not talking about downloading it from the web. I already have that information on my disk, still, 22 hours, right? So that's big data. Some people ask me, and I think this is also important, I'm, I'm sure you've seen something similar. Uh, so all this talk about Internet of Things, how it will change the industries, um, and the use of AI, right, for artificial intelligence for, for these applications, is that actually overhyped? And um, the one thing I have learned in my 20 years working in technology is there are two things you should never do with technology. Never overestimate, but never underestimate the progress you're making. And so um, one way to put the same thing is this Gartner hype curve. Um, which tells you that, of course, depending on where you are in a certain technology, it's certainly overhyped, and uh, then it is underhyped, so to speak. That's sort of the underestimation, and then it, before it gets into a stable, stable, um, uh, stable trend. I think with the Internet of Things, we are sort of on the um, on the up uh, upside here. It's still probably overhyped. What you're going to do? It won't happen as fast as some people think. But if you look away and come back and look at it again, you will be surprised how much progress is going to be done. All right. 
So I will talk a little bit about examples, uh, and we'll keep it high level. But I've thought, um, so these were all just uh, high level charts I showed you, but I thought it might be interesting to just give you a few simple examples how big data from physical systems from the Internet of Things combined with uh, artificial intelligence can actually can actually be used, can actually create better outcomes. And uh, I apologize, some of these charts might be a little bit technical, but I will try my best to um, explain. So the first one is um, on, you know, I was thinking, uh, hey, I'm coming here to Indiana, so I have to take an example, uh, you know, from agriculture. So all three examples I have have something to do with agriculture, right? Because, hey, right, uh, this is, um, this, this is uh, one of the states, of course. So you can imagine um, for all kinds of applications, whether you're a farmer or whether you invest or for your supply chain, understanding how much crop is being produced and planted is important, right? It's important. Um, and as you know, even right, there's a futures market, right? So there are people who actually think, right? Uh, because that's gonna affect, of course, the price of corn, soybean, et cetera. So here's one thing which is uh, something people already doing with the Internet of Things. And something very simple. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting now on, um, on, um, on ice here because I'm not, um, I'm not a business major, as you can tell. But as you, as you know, um, the, the future prices, right, they are obviously influenced by um, by what the government says, at least here in the United States, right? Whenever the U US Department of Agriculture releases a report, or there are gonna be a lot of soy being planted, or there are gonna be high uh, corn yields, they're gonna move the markets. So now there's a whole industry, by the way, including IBM, who are trying to use the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, to figure out that information before the government will release their reports, which is typically quarterly, right? And so this is very simple. What you do is uh, you take a lot of information from mostly satellite information. So you observe the Earth, um, and you, uh, uh, you can actually, this is an interesting plot. I don't know what this, oh, I, yes. sorry. Um, it doesn't seem to work here. Um, in, in any event, you can see that here on the, on the, on the, on the right side that um, the different crops show, of course, a different, show different colors, right? Show different greenness. And so can you train a computer ingesting all this massive amount of satellite information to tell you very early, earlier than um, perhaps the government can do, uh, who's planting what. And then later on, the second question you have is, once you've figured out, okay, someone is planting soybean or corn or wheat or whatnot, can you then actually um, figure out what the yields are? And so that actually is going on already in real time. Um, there are data sets which are being used to do exactly that. There is 10 years of history of satellite information around the whole globe, ready to be used by everyone. But, um, the, the challenge is, uh, how do you use that? There's weather information. There is um, information about the soil type. There is information, there is uh, economic data, which uh, may actually also help you to understand, to interpret the signals, which sometimes aren't. And so you can actually do fairly decent predictions here. This is an example um, which we actually run. Um, this is here a, a state in, in Iowa. And um, I told you, right, the whole, the whole name of the game is to be earlier than what the government reports will be. And this is actually an, an, an analysis of 10 years of, um, where you basically train a computer on nine years of historical uh, satellite information, weather information, soil information. And then use one year to make a decision of, okay, uh, what do these signals tell you and what is happening on the ground? And in this case, you can actually see that uh, we did a fairly decent and accurate prediction 
who's, who's planting what, right? Um, okay, that's the first example. By the way, stuff like this uh, is uh, going on uh, quite a bit in, in, in other areas besides commodity, um, uh, commodity forecasting, right? Um, there are now companies using satellite information or other types of information to figure out how many cars are parked in front of some Walmarts, right? To see what the consumer traffic is, all that kind of information is being used. Here, another example I want to touch with you, how we can use artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, um, big data to, to, to get some bigger outcome is on seasonal weather forecasting. So seasonal weather forecasting is forecasts which go beyond 10 days. And you can imagine there's a tremendous economic uh, value in having better information. You know, how will the weather be in um, four months, right? Uh, will it be a cold winter? Because I might be able to, um, to hedge my cost for heating fuels, right, what not, right, something like this. And so there's a lot of work we do. Um, it's interesting, um, why, why, uh, why, why is this, this important? What I'm showing you here is, this is actually a plot of how the accuracy of forecasts, of weather forecasts, have improved over the last, um, in this case, 30 years. And what you see on this plot is um, there is a forecast for three days, five days, seven days, and 10 days ahead. And you can see there the forecasting accuracy. You have uh, for each forecast horizon two lines. One is for the northern hemisphere, one is for the southern hemisphere. Uh, these two lines are merging, as you can see, uh, in recent days. And it has to do actually with the Internet of Things. It has to do with the use of satellites. It used to be that we had no weather stations and no information from the southern hemisphere. That's why they always had, had, better, had worse weather predictions. But what this plot tells you, this is the reason why I'm showing this, is it shows you before the advent of AI and big data, the average improvements of um, making these models more accurate have only been or have been, you can put it either way, 6% per decade. So armies of scientists have been working on improving the accuracy of all these weather models, which we are using every day. And all these armies of scientists have improved that by 0.6% per year in average. I don't know whether this is a lot or not, but um, it, it seems like, now weather is extremely complicated, but it seems like 0.6% is, is a little bit small, right? Um, anyway, so here is what AI can do and big data. And what it does is, I don't want to go too much into the details, but what it can do is it can actually uh, look into historical weather forecasts and then train a computer to understand which of those forecasts or when these forecasts or for what forecast horizons or for what forecast variables, let it that be temperature or precipitation or what, or what not, right? Uh, these models have been performing better when, where, and under what situation. So it's the same, it's the same question you, can, um, you, you keep on asking, right? If you see these hurricane maps, and in these hurricane maps, what you often see is you see these spaghettis of lines, which are all these different weather models, right? And the computer, what the computer does now is, because it can deal with this massive amount of data, it can say, hey, wait a minute. I have all these predictions about the weather in 30 days. Can I see and look in the, in the history and see which of those models has actually performed better when, where, and under what weather situation? So that's what you can do with AI. And um, uh, let me actually go to this. And that actually works quite well. I'll give you here an example where um, we did these studies where we actually trained a machine learning model, a machine learned weather model based on historical forecast, understanding which of those, which models out of all the models I showed on some of the previous shots is actually performing better when, where, and under what weather situation. 
So here is a forecast which a typical weather model would have. And this is actually for a weather station at PSU, right? Some of your colleagues here a little bit in the east. And uh, this is a 30-day temperature forecast. So 30 days ahead, a model, and this was actually the best model. 30 days later, the measurements from uh, this particular weather station, and we're talking here temperature, comes in. And you know, so this is now 30 days later, and you can see, hey, it's, it's actually not bad. But then in between August 13th, it's not that great, right? Now, if you use AI, if you do specific learning, you can actually do much better. And you can see that actually here, um, where we have actually done training on uh, petabytes of data on historical weather forecast models. Again, what I just explained, where we're going systematically to where are the deficiencies. And indeed, you can do a much better job, right? Indeed, you can capture the temperatures much better. These different numbers here, they depend actually, they, they actually correspond to different machine learning models because we create machine learning models for every weather station, for every weather situation. Um, so some people always ask me, oh, this is just an example you show, right? You can do this for the entire world. You can do it for the entire US. This is actually data from the entire US. We uh, have done benchmarking for um, hundreds of weather stations across the United States for the lower 48. Uh, what is plotted here is a mean absolute error in a temperature prediction, 30 days ahead, one for temperature, one for 10 meter. These are the state of the art models, which a national weather service is issuing, right, the one in red, M1 to M4. Um, these are the people who are improving their models at 0.6% uh, per year. And indeed, it's not like that we are much smarter. It is really just speaks to the power of AI and big data. If you are able to exploit this correctly, we can get easily 30% in a single year. Can we get 30% every year? No but we can certainly get one thirty percent of accuracy improvements, which is quite substantial if you looked into, right? So that, that would correspond to, to many, many, many years of, of research on, on these weather models. Today, this just gives you an idea where, where technology is heading to, right? So as it comes down to learning, um, uh, learning the weather from previous data, this is exactly what we just did. Uh, now people are looking into even other data sources where they use something which people call deep learning. And deep learning is just a form of machine learning which uses really deep neural networks where they actually ingest entire image data from uh, geostationary satellites. Uh, you see that here, right? This is actually the cloud coverage to improve the actual learning of that um, machine learning algorithms and, and use deep learning techniques for that. Okay, the final example, and I promised you they all have something to do with agriculture, now is on, uh, on, um, on, on irrigation uh, optimization. Um, again, this is, of course, I realize, I think in Indiana you have enough water, enough rain here, but in many parts of the country, of course, they don't. In many parts of the world, they don't. So how can you um, use big data, Internet of Things, to do better irrigation? Um, I realize it's a very technical plot, but the interesting part with um, if you irrigate, I know that's not how we irrigate our plants in the garden, but an interesting part of irrigation is that you can actually describe the the loss of water a plant will experience quite well with some pretty simple physics, which is written here. And the only reason why I uh, wrote down these equations is to show you how much data you would need. And it is a lot of data. It's a lot of different data sources. Because to understand how much water a plant would lose, which tells you how much water you would have to replenish, has to do, of course, as you can imagine, with the soil. Right, how, much, how, how fast is the water going into the soil. It has to do with how large a canopy is. It has to do with um, uh, the weather, the wind, the humidity, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of different type of data. Now, through the Internet of Things, we have access to all that data. And so we use that in some real life example 
where we actually worked with uh, some friends out in California uh, in, at Gallo. Actually, I, um, Gallo Wineries. So Gallo is one of the largest wine producers in the world, where we try to use irrigation optimization to improve the yield and the quality of grapes, the wine. Okay? And uh, more specifically, the, the, the key issue we're trying to address here is uh, when they harvest these grapes, right? it's not like uh, some guy is going through um, the field with a basket and picking the grapes. No, no, that's not how it works. They run these gigantic machines, so the vineyard, that actually shakes the plants. Then the grapes fall onto this tray down there. It's being weighted. And then they know, of course, if, if they have a GPS system on this machine, which drives through the vineyard, actually it drives it at, at, at almost 25 miles per hour, they know exactly how much yield they had in different places. Guess what? When they harvest, they see that even in a small area, they have differences in yield of a factor of three. So you might have gotten um, 13, um, uh, 13 tons per acre here. Over there, you only got um, four. Okay, and this is what this plot actually shows on the left side. So what we did with Gallo is we used the Internet of Things to see whether we can actually do a better job, make it more uniform, or bring up the low-performing parts of the field uh, to a level which uh, would... Um, um, to, to maybe the average level, then you get more yield. If you have it more uniform, if you have higher uniformity, you get also better quality. So here is um, the IoT, Internet of Things, implementation architecture. I uh, don't want to show you too many details, uh, but uh, what you really do is you observe with a satellite um, what's happening on the ground. Right? Remember, we're talking about massive vineyards. These are not small vineyards. Um, you're, 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 you're basically taking satellite information every day in, and you look at um, how the vineyard performing and which, and you can actually decipher this from, uh, from the spectral bands of the satellite. Uh, where, do you, where do you expect high yields and low yields? So why the plants are growing? Okay, you do this every day. And then you run your analytics, similar to what I showed you before, on all that big data in the cloud. You make a decision and say, you know what? I need to do something to these plants. I need to do something with these plants. And the something is you basically optimize the irrigation. And you tune the integration. You either over-irrigate or you under-irrigate or you do some stressing. And that's what we basically did. So here is, um, because everything was so abstract, this shows you a little bit. And I'm just showing this for fun, how this uh, looks like. So this was a vineyard. <laughs> um, so massive, right? And pretty boring. Um, here you see, um, as I said, you had to, this is actually the, the base controller. So once we figured out, okay, how much irrigation we should apply, that information was sent to the base controller, they call it base station. Uh, or gateway, and then these different control boxes were controlled to make a decision on how much water should be applied, right? And that was done then, right? You were basically just uh, optimizing it. And it, it, it's very complicated. It's not as simple as I put, right? Because you, you can tune all kinds of parameters, right? You can say, okay, do I going to put a lot of water down in one hour, or do I wait for a longer time and then irrigate less, et cetera, et cetera. So all these things were considered here. Okay. Anyway, um, did that actually work? So that was an interesting question. Oh, sorry. And indeed, and I wouldn't show you this otherwise, right? <laughs> indeed, it did work. Um, but uh, it, it actually, in hindsight, it wasn't very surprising that it did work. It was actually phenomenal. Um, we were able, the whole vineyard was on auto control. Remember, no people were involved. That was all done with analytics and AI. Uh, but it turned out we got 26% more yield. 
26% more yield is a big deal because you think about it, right? Now, with 80% of the land, you can produce the same amount of food. That's pretty good, right? Uh, but then even better, this is what these plots show, uh, we did this by using less water. And then, uh, you, right, this was in California. You, you, you realize California has a big water crisis. And because we were also, I showed you this yield map, right, with all these different yields you had across that field. We had higher uniformity, and higher uniformity uh, gets better quality. We were also able to improve the quality of this. Now, initially, when we did this, IBM and Gallo, this was sort of a pilot, uh, what they call POC. And now this is in over um, 12 different vineyards and it's being fully commercialized as an IoT solution. And it's one of those early pieces where you can actually, early, 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 early pieces of evidence that the Internet of Things has uh, a lot of impact. And in this case, probably a lot of good, good, good impact. All right, I will, uh, will summarize here. Um, so, um, right, um, key point is look at all the technology trends. Uh, digitization of the physical world is accelerating and will impact traditional industries in a major way. I think that's, that's no question. There are still technical challenges. I touched on some of them. We could have dived much deeper into them to be able to exploit all that massive amount of data being generated. But that is exciting because that means I'm in the research division. I still have a job next year to, to, uh, on something I can work on. And I think also a take home message is um, yeah, don't overestimate the impact of AI and IoT in the short term, but for sure don't underestimate it either, right? That's uh, something you want to keep in mind. And with that, thanks so much. We have time for questions and microphones. We'll be coming around to you if you just put your hand up. Hello. Uh, besides agriculture, what are the main uh, other spheres of application of IT and uh, what can IoT da, uh, do in like physical world, in business terms? Yeah, so um, that's a very good question. I touched a little bit on the automotive transportation. It's, um, if you think about the impact it has, I think there will be one of the biggest impacts, just because how ingrained automotive is right in our culture, uh, at least the culture I grew up with, uh, how full countries, like my own home country, Germany, right, depends on a single industry. I, I think uh, automotive will be one of the forefronts. And I think also if I look at the economics, it seems to me a no-brainer that uh, that will happen. Because at some point, someone going to come to you and say, right, dear Mr. Student, I will give you the same transportation you have if you buy your own car, but I do it for half of the money. And I will, no one will say no, right? People don't have their own airplanes, right? They, 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 they share airplanes. So I think that's one. The other industry I have not talked a lot about, but I see clear evidence there too. Lots of activities is in insurance, right? The whole insurance sector. Um, they will go to very different models. We already see this, right? Where they try to award uh, behaviors. It will be much more outcome. Uh, driven, there will be much more targeted insurance products as well, right? Because you can now start insuring things against very certain events when a whole set of new products. Uh, the other, the, the third one I would just like to mention is, of course, and I touched already on this, is the financial industry. There is a term in the financial industry uh, called alternative data, um, which they they, they use it for, right, all the intelligence comes from what they call um, transactional data credit card transactions. That's how they do the hedge funds. You go to the hedge funds, that's how they actually run their models, make their predictions, et cetera, et cetera, the analysts. Now, the new frontier is there. Oh, what other data is there? And a lot of that will be IoT data. Mm. Uh, 
Uh, yes, if, um, if automobiles are used, not used 95% of the time, then what percentage of this monthly 45 exabytes of data is never used? Yeah, that is, by the way, this is a very good point. Um, <laughs> so, um, so um, currently, and that is the challenge in IoT, I, I, I certainly would agree with, I guess, your, the premise of your question, which is a lot of that is not used. And that is a pity because it costs a lot of money, right? It costs a lot of money to collect it. And if there is anything where you could be a little bit um, skeptical about IoT is, if we fail using that data, right? If you fail it, then there's no value, right? Then there will be nothing besides cost, right? <laughs> Collecting the data. And then at some point, someone's going to say it doesn't make any sense. Um, and I think a lot of that is going on. Uh, now, remember, IT technology is so efficient and so cheap, so to speak, that you probably don't have to use 44 exabytes to get the full value, to, to, to get enough value to justify all that cost by collecting all that data. So as long as we are able to provide, and that's why I showed some of these examples, uh, and where we can actually demonstrate tangible benefits to what we do, um, we, can a lot, we, we can afford a lot of overhead. But if there's anything to be skeptical is if we fail on exploiting that data. And by the way, failing uh, to exploit that data could also include other issues, such as uh, privacy, such as security, right? Um, bad, bad things happening with the data, political, um, whatever, um, 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 new laws which would prohibit us doing certain things, et cetera, right? Mm. So I'll preface this a bit in that uh, I'm a PhD student that works on numerical weather prediction models, actually, the mathematics behind them. So I'm kind of curious in the sense of you're talking about using big data in terms of using a lot of those predictions. And I see a lot of benefit of that in a lot of the dis discussions going on. Um, however, like AI is still very much a black box in how it works and what it susses out and the predictions it makes and are useful. But in my work, you know, like I'm focusing on the physics and the mathematics that run those models and perhaps you know, if we then let AI take over using, doing those predictions, then you lose understanding what the physics and what's actually going on. Do you, do you have any like, perspective on that sort of mm -hmm. approach and whether or not one may be more valid than the other? Or if we to, were to take on AI, do we then lose out some of the understanding of what's actually happening in, say, the atmosphere? Yeah, I, I appreciate your question very much. Um, it's a good question. I think the first mistake we all do is Right, and I think it's a fault of us. So the people who are doing AI, they think, hey, and it's great technology. They think they can replace physics, right? They can replace insights. Because remember, what you do in AI, as, as you pointed out, you learn something, and it's eventually pretty much a black box. It doesn't have to be a black box, but in many cases, it's a black box. You actually don't know why this thing is working. And that is a problem, right? That, that can be a problem. On the other hand, it is super powerful. Why is AI so powerful? Why is machine learning so powerful? Because you don't have to understand it. You don't have to be an expert. But I think our problem is we come from these two different schools of thoughts, right? So you have, on one hand, I call them um, the engineers, the physicists. And by the way, I'm a physicist. On the other hand, you have the people who are coming from a computer science background. And the, it's not one is better than the other. I think they can both help each other. Right? You can make physics models much more accurate. You can actually use AI to learn something about your physics models as well. Uh, but you can certainly, um, uh, you certainly um, they, it, that, that benefit can come out the other way around as well. So I think, uh, in, fact, um, in fact, we do a lot in, in IBM research around this. How can you bring in physics engineering models with big data together, right? Why do I need, why do I have to train an AI model um, about, let's say I have temperature sensors in this room, right? 
And um, I know, right, uh, I know, and, and let's say I wanted to optimize whatever the HVAC system in this room, right? There would be a lot of benefits there, I could do this. But I already know there is um, a relationship between these sensors because I know there's the conservation of mass, there's a conservation of energy, there's conservation of momentum. So if I already know this, why do I need a machine learning model to, reco to um, recover that, uh, to, to um, rediscover that? I don't, right? So how can I bring these things together? There's an answer. Uh, I, uh, you mentioned that uh, you gave an example where uh, in case of agriculture, we can find out the crop uh, yields even before the government. And it, uh, it can affect the futures market. A lot of futures trading goes on in the agriculture side. So how, how do you monetize this data when you have this information before even the government? So what's, right, uh, how you put it to use, mm -hmm. basically? So in the, in the futures market, right, is a way to um, monetize that, that data yeah. because um, and, um, there are many companies like, like IBM who are working with um, big financial companies to help them with what they regard as alternative data. So if I know that the USDA report will, be, uh, will tell me in five days there will be a big swing towards corn. And I have early evidence of that, <coughs> then of course, that's an opportunity to make, to, to, to make, to so, make money. Uh, no, so, so basically, I mean, uh, uh, we have financial, I mean, clients who, who, have, uh, who, do, who do trading in uh, futures yeah. market, and so, so we have basically touch points across the globe where we can find out, you know, what's going on with the commodity thing, and we can take uh, action in advance. So, so that's how we. Yeah. The other, the other, the other, I didn't went to this, but you know what? All the satellite information also allows you to do, which is kind of fascinating, is it allows you to go back and look into. Okay, so there, there's a farmer made a decision. Oh, I'm plant wheat, or I do this, or I do that, or I don't do anything this year, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we have analyzed um, over 10 years of history of that, of that pattern for each. Actually, in the United States, for every 10 meter resolution, what happened on that field in the last 10 years, uh, we have a very good idea. Now, you can then get these decisions from the past, and you can wonder yourself, hey, why did that person switch, whatever, he went from corn, and he said wheat, soybean, soybean, whatever, certain patterns, right? Why was that decision made? And you would be surprised that with 98% probability, you can build a model uh, knowing based on economics, knowing also on, on other parameters, there's not just economics, why these decisions were, were made by a farmer, which means you already know before the farmer made up his mind himself, his or herself, yeah. uh, what they're most likely going to be doing. Um, that's a US statement with 98% probability. One small clarification. Um, you mentioned, you gave an example of, uh, you know, where uh, of, of a farm where uh, the, the yield differs, differs by factor of three. Like for an acre, there was a four, uh, uh, um, by a factor of three, the, the yield across the, across the farm. And uh, uh, by experimenting and uh, mm -hmm. uh, we were able to improve the yields by 26% or something. Yeah. So, so uh, what was the result on, uh, uh, on the produce, which was like one, one, one third initially? of the topmost. So was it like on the base of four, we were like uh, able to improve it to yeah, five? Yeah, so there was or? a reference. Uh, actually, sorry, I, I glanced on, um, I, I didn't explain this very well. But uh, good question. There, there was a reference field. So there was one, one business as usual. And we did it over three years. So the whole study on the yield improvement, the 26% is a, 
is a result from three years putting one part of the vineyard onto autopilot with <laughs> analytics versus an exactly um, an, 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 a reference field which had very similar behaviors and very similar yields before, and everything was relative to that. Uh, We have time for one final question. Very interesting presentation. Uh, with all of that massive data that's sitting out there, the one thing that you really haven't touched on in any detail is the privacy and the security issues, which are becoming huge as people are getting hacked, big companies are getting hacked. The fear is the utilities, the financial sector, could be put on its knees if we're not careful. What is going on that you could kind of shed some light on? Yeah, so that is a very good question. Um, the, the one thing I might want to say is, and I know this is not a very good answer, but at least gives, gives us a reference point, is privacy issues in IoT are probably less severe, they are there for sure, than in healthcare, right, or personal data, et cetera, right? The other, the other comment I just want to make is, you know, why do people love, for example, satellite observation so much, right? It is because you can take that data. There is no, that's, that's, that's a wild west because you have your satellite up there, right, 20 kilometers up <laughs> flying and, and, and taking pictures. So, right, no one can prevent, for example, a Russian uh, satellite taking a picture of the United States. So I don't even know how you would prevent, how governments could prevent something like this besides shooting these satellites down or something like this, right? Which is obviously not really an option. But I, on, a, on a larger picture, I think you're completely right that um, the whole industry right, has to has to come up with ways how we can deal with all that information and how can we ensure privacy. As you probably know, the Europeans have just launched, whatever, it just came out, right, this new, um, basically new privacy laws for, for data. Uh, they could serve as a template. Uh, it mostly deals with personal data. So, for example, you have the right uh, that all your data is being destroyed if you want. Data can only be um, collected if you opt in for a particular purpose, etc. So they put at least, I mean, it's probably not the, not the best, and I'm not saying this couldn't be improved. But I think it is a, a, a sort of a start, which we... I do believe eventually we'll see here in the US too, right? Uh, something of that. Um, mm. but, uh, I don't have a really good answer to it. I, I want to be honest. Yep. So, what you're saying is that individual organizations are the ones that are responsible for distributing technologies? I don't think so. I mean, if you, are, well, let me just say um, my personal opinion is there is rule for regulation, right? And there, there, there's room for regulations. For sure. And there should be more regulations. There should be sensible regulations, what we can do with that data and not, right? I think also the purpose, how we use that data, right? So if you can, for example, uh, use that data really to reduce pollution, to become more efficient, right? Uh, if we have ways to anonymize that data, right? To make it less personal, to, to, to anonymize that data, then I think uh, the benefits outweigh, uh, could, could outweigh the risks. It's an open discussion. Okay. If you could please join me in thanking our speaker, Dr. Hammond, we appreciate you being here.